Okay, this is my take on a quadrature decoder circuit. So let's look at the input signals. We have the two signals of quadrature, which are S1 and S2 from the two sensors. And they're generating these two signals here, which are square waves. And we're just going to show the pulses in the two directions. So this area is the clockwise direction, and this area is the counterclockwise direction. And what we want to do with these two quadrature encoded signals is generate pulses on this up and down so that we have just clocks going from the clockwise direction on one output and clocks from the counterclockwise direction on the other output. And those two are shown here. So this would be clockwise pulses and counterclockwise pulses on the outputs here. And you'll notice that when we have clockwise pulses, there are no pulses in the counterclockwise direction. And similarly, when there's pulses in the counterclockwise direction, there's no pulses in the clockwise direction. So those are the inputs and outputs that we're looking for, but how do we get from input to output? So let's look at the clocking arrangement. Well, I'm gonna, we've got these two flip-flops in here, which we're going to clock data in and out of. So we want to be able to get a clock signal here that goes to both flip-flops. And we're going to generate it from the input signal. So we're going to use these three gates to generate the clock. Now, of course, this gate is an AND gate. So when both signal one and signal two are high, the output of this guy is high. This is a typical AND gate. And that would end up in this trace here. When both this signal and this signal are high, we get a pulse here. And we want to have another signal when both signals are low. In other words, when neither signal is high, we have this NOR gate. So when neither signal is high, we're talking about this area. And we have an output pulse down here corresponding to neither input going high. In other words, when they're both low. So now we have these two signals with just two gates. And we can combine them into a pulse clock with an OR gate. So when either this one or this one are high, we get a pulse clock output like that. And of course, these things are going to be edge triggered flip flops. So we're looking only at the positive edge of these, this pulse clock. And that's what we have down at the, the bottom here. These are the edges of the clock that will be used to trigger the flip-flops. So now that we've generated the clock, let's look at the data coming into these flip-flops. And we want to latch um, signals that are stable. So when uh, sensor one or sensor two are transitioning, they are not guaranteed to be in any particular state. They can be going up and down or vibrating or, or something like that. So we're not really sure what's happening at those edges. So we want to clock them, the data when it's stable in the middle, either high or low. And that's what this clock does. This clock corresponds to the center where of uh, sensor one where it's stable. And again, when the second clock is happening right in the middle of when it's low. So these clocks are great for clocking in the data from sensor one. And as long as sensor one is following this pattern down here, it's going to be stable when these clocks arrive. Similarly, when we're going clock counterclockwise, we have the same clocks, but they're occurring when 
sensor 2 is stable, which is here and here, corresponding to the clock, whoops, clock, which is happening right in the middle of the high and low pulse from sensor 2. So that sounds good, but uh, we, we, we have some circuitry here, which is sort of latching up, and I'm going to describe that right now. So this, pop, this trace here is the latched signal right here of sensor 1. So you'll notice that it's the same as sensor 1. Um, you know, it's the same as sensor 1, and I've colored it the same color. Uh, so when sensor 1 is leading, when sensor 1 goes high first, then the latched version of sensor 1 dominates this circuit. And it just follows what sensor 1 is doing. So when sensor 1 goes high, we've got a high here. It means that we have a low output here, which disables this guy. So he's always going to be low on his output, as long as this is low on the input. And that means this guy is always high. And that high enables our um, AND gate for the uh, sensor 1. So sensor 1 is propagating through this gate because it's got a high enable on it. And that helps us a little bit. So that's what happens on the set. So it clocks whenever we have a set on the high end that will cause the output to go high. But how do we get it to go low? Well, we've inverted this high signal to here. And so when so when the input goes low, this guy goes high. And that's feeding into the reset pulse, which is high when we want to reset the output. So when the clock happens and this reset is high, the output goes low, which is what happens here, and that's what we want. So this all works great when we're going clockwise, and we're only looking at what's happening on this output. So that's very clean. What's happening on the other output, though, we want nothing happening there. But what is happening? So when this guy is high, this one's low, which means this guy is low and this is high. This is just held in this, low, in this position as long as this guy stays low, this one is high. And that high is on the reset line. So the reset in this uh, set reset device dominates. So when you clock it, if that reset is high, that output is going low, which is what we want down here. But that's only one of the conditions, of course, because this signal doesn't always stay low. When sensor one goes low here, it opens up the door for sensor 2 to start, start dominating this latch circuit. So when we have a low on the sensor 1, we have a high on its output here, and a high on the input here enables sensor 2 to start dominating. And whatever's on sensor 2 happens on the output, which latches up uh, sensor 1, by the way. So when sensor 2 is dominating, it means that sensor 1 has gone low here. That means we have a high here, which enables sensor 2 to dominate. And at this point in time, sensor 2 is high, so we have a high coming out. 
on the output of this gate here, which is going in to the set line. Now that's not really dangerous at this point in time because there is no clock happening at that point in time. But it is dangerous that this is high. And so if there is a clock that shows up while this is high, we would have a, a output going high in this area, which we don't want. If this input goes low, which is the sensor two, um, and uh, that inverts here and, and puts an output high here, this high is going into the reset line and the reset dominates. So any clock that happens while this is high um, will make the output go low and we don't, that's no problem for us. The only time this is dangerous is when we have a high here, which could set the flip-flop if we get a clock during this time. So that is when we're here and this guy is high and he only gets a clock when he's going low and we have to decide if he's going to get a clock before or after he goes low. That happens when this input goes low. Eventually, the output of that AND gate will go low. And the clock happens after the low signal propagates through this NOR gate, which is uh, the, this rising edge here is happening on this NOR gate. So that clock is occurring two gate delays after the signal goes low. Whereas the signal goes low here, one gate delay after the input goes low. So this signal goes low before the clock arrives which is a safe condition, so the output will stay low. An alternative scenario is if the, if this input actually goes low, then this output goes high, and a high here on the reset is also a safe condition. If a clock occurs, when the reset is high, it will force the output low. So it's a safe condition when the reset is high and that but that's an extra gate delay so if we really wanted to make the clock occur after this went high we could do that but either by hoping that this is a long enough delay to happen after this goes high or we can add in some delay here with the extra inverters um, which are just causing a delay. So this circuit can be uh, adjusted to work no matter what the gate delays are through these circuits here. And in practice I have tested it and it is very robust. It's rock solid. It never misses a, a clock and it never gets an extra clock. So when we're operating in the counterclockwise direction, we have an exactly analogous situation. It's a symmetrical circuit, so it operates exactly the same way, except that sensor two is leading and sensor one is trailing. And that has the exact effect of allowing counterclockwise pulses on this count and there is no activity on the up count. So that's my take on a quadrature decoder circuit of this design. My explanation may be a little bit scattered, but in practice it works very well. And I have not been able to make the counter mess up with false counts or missing counts.